thank you both so much for being here to chat at the ESG Summit. Thanks thank you. Having. Thanks for having us. Um, talk to me a little bit about why private capital is unique in ESG. Well, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, and maybe I can just zoom out a little mm -hmm. bit um, and provide some context. So we, in my role, E2P is a middle market buyout firm focused exclusively in food and beverage. We actually like to say we eat, breathe, and sleep the food sector like no one else. We, so by virtue of being growth-oriented, food-focused, ESG is a very natural fit, a natural extension of our work. And I joined the firm two years ago um, as a member of the investment committee, but also partner in charge of ESG. That role has now evolved, and this is going to come full circle back to your question, has now evolved to be to lead our fundraising efforts, our brand. We launched a new brand in conjunction with our the close of fund two and and business transformation. ESG is a central part of each of those. And I would say, I think I would probably focus on when you ask, you know, how ESG can be unique in PE or, or vice versa, we have found it's really an additional lens on our investments. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, we um, kind of differentiate ourselves based on experience, relationships, and ideas. And ideas means looking around corners, ESG and focusing on material, environmental, social, and governance issues has given us just another kind of insight to see opportunity and risk where others don't. That's great. How about you, Jonathan? Yeah, so first off, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. um, so Grovner, where I work as head of sustainability and impact investing, um, sits a little bit differently in the ecosystem than E2P. So we are um, an institutional asset manager helping pensions, corporates, sovereigns invest their money mm -hmm. in alternatives and private capital specifically. Um, within that, 80% of our business is custom accounts. And the reason I bring that up is that um, within this world of ESG, which we at Grovner don't use that term, and I think we'll talk about that later, um, we like to give institutions the ability to customize their investment strategies to the themes that they care most about. Um, because we don't think that everyone wants diversity and climate and healthcare and education all lumped together. We think different organizations and different groups of stakeholders care about different things. And so our job is to create a really wide moat of investment options so that then we, when we work with institutions, they can pick and choose what they want off of that. Um, the reason I think that I spend most of my time um, in infrastructure, private equity, growing amount in private credit, but really the private capital sector around sustainability, um, because we do have a, um, a hedge fund to fund business as well, um, is that I think the structure of investments in those worlds really lends to um, really having better transparency and more ability to create change and outcomes. Mm -hmm. So when you are a private equity owner like E2P and you own a majority stake of a company, um, or even a large minority stake, um, as compared to a public shareholder who might own a half a percent of a company, your ability to go into the company, sit down with management, um, chart out 100-day plans, set initiatives, provide resources, targets, um, it, it's really very different. Like You have the ability to really like craft and focus on the things that you think matter the most. Um, I don't think that public companies, that's as easy to do. Um, we see a ton of really large public companies doing great things, but they have a lot of different stakeholders. And when you are a small kind of voice in that, you can make a difference, but I think it's different, I think, in terms of the level of success and impact to right. that. So I think like to me, again, that's why um, it's interesting money first flowed um, from a marketing perspective into public solutions around DSG. I think now there's a lot of people questioning, does that work? Does it create alpha? Um, is it achieving kind of the goals that they want? Some yes, some no. Um, whereas on the private markets, it was a little bit slower, but we're just seeing a constant increase at this point. Um, because I think people really now are starting to believe and we are fortunate to now have some pretty deep track records that support that um, you know, sustainable investing and financial returns can be complementary mm -hmm. and not actually you know, fighting each other, which some assumed. 
I absolutely agree. I'm mean, just to add to this, because yeah. you made this comment yesterday and it really stuck with me. My life before E2P was all in strategy led transformation, strategy, uh, corporate strategy, consulting with Deloitte Consulting. So mostly focused on large public companies. And I would 100% agree that within the ownership model, there are very unique attributes. You listed several of them that has, I think, enabled that most faster progress yeah or, or maybe progress period <laughs> but one, one thing i will say is um this is my third year at the conference um and what i really enjoy about the conference is getting to sit with both those corporates as well as investors now mm -hmm. and one of the things that i took away three years ago and has continued to be kind of like a guiding like you know light for me is that Corporates and the largest corporates of America, whether it's Walmart or Amazon or some of the big technology companies that are here or food companies that are all at this conference, they've kind of just like gone in one direction. You know, there's been a lot of noise in the system, but like they've listened to their stakeholders and they think it's good business. It's value accretive. Um, I think in the investment world, there's been more debate around, am I giving up something to do this? Whereas I think, um, again, I'm not sure it was the investors that caused the push towards sustainability at places like Walmart. I think it actually was the other stakeholders. I think it was, how do you retain and hire your employees? How do you, um, your customers who want more sustainable product? Mm -hmm. Like to me, like that's what was really driving the Starbucks and the Walmarts. Mm -hmm. Investors I think helped because there was a growing amount of interest in it. But I, that's my guess and what I've heard from people here, and you would probably know better from the inside. No, I, I think you're 100% right about those stakeholders. I also, in my last two years at Deloitte, talking to chief sustainability officers, several of whom are here, but across industries, you know, from telecom and media to, um, you know, the global social media platform, consumer products companies, et cetera. When you ask, even though the what of what they're doing is very different, the issues around the how were shockingly identical. And one of them, um, when you ask who is the primary stakeholder driving this change, it tends to be investors, but that is connected to all the other stakeholders that you that you mentioned. Um, just to add on to your okay. point, and we're gonna we have this private capital session tomorrow. We another interesting, I think it's kind of come full circle back to the investment community or the private capital community that so many of these large corporates, you know, 95% of their emissions are in scope three. Mm -hmm. Their relationships with suppliers are so critical to achieving these ESG goals, which, you know, all of these stakeholders are laser focused on. And so now re-enter private capital mm -hmm. where many of these private companies that are suppliers to these mm -hmm. Fortune 100s are owned by firms like mine and Jonathan's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so a funny story, um, and you might've been in the room for this at another event um, with the Aspen Institute, there was a very large unnamed private equity firm and she said, um, she was the head of sustainability and she said, my um, team doesn't exist because the managing partner cares about the climate or cares about X, Y, Z issue. It really exists at the end of the day because the middle market companies that we invest in need to show a certain amount of understanding and commitment towards certain issues to be in the Walmart supply chain, the Starbucks supply chain, the Disney supply chain. And so again, that's why I think what's really interesting is that there's been this great kind of, you know, interconnectivity between the largest corporates leading the way as well as, you know, private capital. Um, because for us to be successful kind of investors in small and middle-sized businesses, we have to be following what big companies care about. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, you know, again, they're leading the way in that. And that's changed a lot of philosophies and mindsets um, within private capital firms. That's interesting. That's, that's really fascinating. So within private capital, what would you say are the important ESG factors specifically? And, and I mean, maybe in contrast with yeah. some of the bigger corporations. I can start and then yeah, I'll hand it yeah. to Amy because she's a little closer to the actual portfolio companies. So I, we've always had 
um, a separate and distinct operational due diligence team. So we have about 10 to 15 people who are lawyers, accountants, trained by CIA interrogation people. All their expertise is to look at the controls, the governance structures, the background checks, everything that always fit in the G. And so interestingly, before ESG was ever a term, Grosvenor always had what we called ODD. And so that was operational due diligence and we continue to do that. And so when people ask us about the governance angle, we really you know, utilize that practice for that. And I think there's a lot of really important things you see, especially when you have managers of different size or companies of different size, they have different unique challenges in terms of you know, what suppliers are they hiring or professional services? Like what are their controls? How are they doing valuations? All these different things. So I think um, governance is really interesting, but if you look at the European um, regulatory framework, they actually separate out governance now. So they talk about good governance, they say it's a must in every investment, but then they really separate looking at what are the environmental or social factors or both that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if we look at those types of things, and I'll let Amy talk about again within portfolio companies, it ranges tremendously. Um, and I'll give an example. We work both in infrastructure where energy transition and renewables mm -hmm. has been a massive investment theme for a long time. And then we also have this wide private equity business that invests in everything from food company to technology companies to industrials to all these different things. We had a client who asked us to work um, across both of those areas. And um, they asked us to replicate the analysis around sustainability that we had done in the infrastructure space in the private equity space. And what our teams kind of came back to us was um, because private equity is so much broader, the um, materiality of what issues really matter within that E, S, or G really varies tremendously. So like if we're going and looking at a technology company, it might not be around the carbon emissions, even though that is the most popular topic. Um, whereas again, in infrastructure, it's a little bit narrower of universe. It's more environmentally focused. It's more hard assets. It's avoided emissions. It's scope emissions, things like that. So. Um, what I would just say generally, because we have over 500 managers actively that we invest in, I think that there's many, many subclassifications under the E, S, and G. And again, just to give you an example, we have a classification system at Grosvenor that we built, but even with something like under the environment, we have some people who it's water or it's natural resource utilization or it's carbon footprint or it's even methane or other types of gases that are really potent or it's um, other types of pollution. And so within each of these categories, I think there's actually a ton of very different sub themes. And I think in Amy's world, you can talk about like within food, it's probably a little narrower, but it, it's more tangible in some ways. Absolutely. And I'm just in listening to you, I'm realizing how much easier my life is than yours. It's a much more complex set and it makes sense given where you sit. So I think one additional point of context, we talk about, and I think this has already kind of come up in, in the way both of us described how ESG shows up at our firms. We talk about the difference between an ESG informed process versus ESG informed products. Mm -hmm. And you spoke to, you know, some of the customer interests in a specific product. So at our firm, we approach this, we believe we have established an ESG informed investment process and value creation process. So that is rooted in the concept of materiality. What is materiality, right? It means uh, specifically the issues that are, that have the potential to significantly impact your financial performance or your reputational performance. Mm -hmm. So when I said we think of ESG as an additional lens on our investments, it's you know broadening the aperture a bit further to evaluate the non material non-financial risks and opportunities that, that fall in that environmental, social, and governance bucket. And we had a conversation in one of the private capital sessions yesterday. We also subscribe to the Seraphine Kramer Porter study and belief system that when you invest in material, perform, material ESG performance and specifically do not invest in the non-material that you will outperform your competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so in, for a, a firm that invests exclusively in food and beverage, it is very simple. There's about nine or 10 issues that are 
we you know we consider material for all of our companies at this stage and those would include what you'd expect you know food safety employee health and safety employee engagement mm -hmm. um, uh, social and environmental controls in the supply chain etc the only thing I will add to this is where when you take it a step further and really evaluate okay now within these nine or ten issues where where are the opportunities for risk and cost avoidance where's the opportunity for continuous improvement thus EBITDA growth and where is that kind of single we call it like the North Star opportunity for true enterprise value creation additional exit multiples and you know, when you talked about data privacy just to bring it full circle I will often use the example with uh, my team I worked for a large uh, the largest global um, social media platform as part of my work at Deloitte and they were very focused on environment all the time and you know the same way that that's probably not their North Star it's like data privacy we need to be focused on data privacy because it could put us out of business if we have a breach but it's never going to be the differentiator it is never going to be the North Star opportunity at a food and beverage manufacturing company mm -hmm. I, I one thing I'll just add to that is um, if we go back when we first started our team, our sustainability team at Grosvenor about four years ago, um, the conversation always started with risk. So ESG in my mind, I was previously an investor for 10 years, it was a risk mitigant tool for the most part. I think the greatest evolution that we've seen is what Amy's showing, which is how do you not only identify the risks, but how do you look for the value creation? And I think that um, that's come for two different reasons. One, um, as people who are focused on sustainability and using that lens, we have to sit next to people who are just looking at the financials every day. They're just looking at the profit and loss. And so in order to talk the same language and really get buy-in and have that partnership, we have to translate the risks and opportunities that we see from a sustainable non-financial lens to actionable P&L. Okay, profit and loss. Um, because at the end of the day, we're in the business of making money. These are not concessionary approaches. Some people do that, that's not what we do. Um, and so it's really been an evolution of how sustainable investors have learned how to speak closer to the language of traditional investors mm -hmm. that now, for instance, in our infrastructure business, there's really no conversation where we're not talking about those environmental risks or opportunities. It's really been embedded. And so my hope is that the other asset classes that we play in, that becomes more and more the norm. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really been an evolution. And then I think, secondly, all, we all work for large institutions for the most part. Um, right. And those large institutions are pensions, they're corporates, they're sovereigns, they're family offices. Um, most of them have stakeholders that they actually have a fiduciary duty to. Um, and are actually serving a really important social purpose. Like I think sometimes yeah. we forget that, which is there's hundreds of police officers or thousands or millions of teachers out there, and this is their retirement. That's right. And so yeah. we need to be yeah. investing in a way that generates returns so they can live off that. And we need to be taking into account all those material risks and opportunities. And so they rightfully so, as our limited partners, have done a really good job at making sure that when we invest with a sustainable lens, we're paying attention to those financial factors and how every externality translates into some form of profit or loss. And so I think the industry is evolving and I think the communication and the lens um, has really gotten so much better because now it's really a conversation around value creation, process improvement, um, again, cost and opportunity set. That's right. Um, whereas I think if you went back five years ago, I don't think it would be about that. I think it would be about your traditional um, risk profile of environmental, social, or governance. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. In fact, it was like compliance and reporting, and then, oh wow, once we were reporting and tracking this data, it looks like we might there may be some risk avoidance and cost avoidance in it, right? And mm -hmm. then to your point, it's continued. I just just to add one more point to Jonathan's. You know, the other side of materiality is that those same issues that have the potential to materially impact your business are also the flip side of that is that is your best opportunity 
to impact the world, mm -hmm. right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, I don't want to lose that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you were talking a little bit about having common language and the way that we communicate about this. And I think as a last question, what I'd like to ask is, um, the term ESG is a really charged one these days. It's politically charged. There are a lot of misconceptions about it. Can each of you talk a little bit about, um, you know, if you had a magic wand, what would you call it instead? Um, and, uh, you know, addressing potentially like some of those misconceptions, what, what is it that, that you would call it so that people actually sure. understand this thing that you're so passionate about? Well, I think I would start, it's almost like everything old is new again. Yeah. Responsible investment continues to be, I think, the lens that, you know, whether it's S, um, SRI and, you know, things that you specifically will not invest in, which then involve to be something in between that and ESG. And, but it's still under the lens, under the umbrella of responsible investment. So on one hand, I say, let's up level it back to that. That is the intention. But then also you know, click down to talk about what you actually mean. So we've had already, you know, halfway into this summit, there's been, Judy started with the challenge, um, raising the point that the backlash hasn't necessarily been all bad. And in some ways it has really forced a level of precision, mm -hmm. which I found, I mean, I thought that was, it was very relatable. And I, that's exactly how we've talked about it at our firm. And it has forced us to, drill down to the issues, the material mm -hmm. topics that we've been talking about and, and really articulate our thesis around those specific topics. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I, I vote for more precision. Yeah. More. I, I think it's a great point. I, um, our president said to me a year or two ago, he said, don't worry about the acronym, just focus on what theme or what you're specifically doing. And so we really try right. and take that approach. like. If we're talking about climate or climate solutions or energy transition, let's talk about that. And funny enough, in the infrastructure world, it's not really uh, as hot of a topic as you would find. You know, um, the word energy transition plays way more comfortably than impact or ESG does. Um, the so I, I think precision is a great point. We were fortunate enough by chance, not you know a little bit of luck, but we labeled our team from the start as sustainability. Um, to us, it was about how do you invest in a more sustainable way? Um, and again, I think it was from our history, which is we have a very large diverse manager investing practice. Um, and we didn't think that that needed to be lumped in with environmental factors or people that wanted to focus on the climate. And so um, we wanted to create kind of an umbrella that felt wider where people could find their space and not feel like they had to put everything together. And so, you know, in a business of ours where it's really, there's the flexibility to give um, our clients choice. Um, we like the term sustainability, but I will tell you, um, we're working on stuff in Europe right now because 45% of our clients are outside the US and ESG is still the acronym. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you hear the word sustainability, you know, you have to think twice, does that mean environmental sustainability? Right. Um, so we, I think, are all working to evolve the term. And I agree with Amy. I think the backlash has helped in that it's just focused people with precision of what they're actually doing. Because I don't think a lot of us, especially on the private capital side, we're investing across ES and G. Correct. We, most of, most mm -hmm. managers were really focusing on certain thematic areas within that. Um, and so I think that you know having terms that are a little broader that don't lump everything together are beneficial. Um, and that doesn't mean that in your investment process, as Amy said, just in general due diligence, that you don't look at environmental, social, and governance right. factors. But that's not what really excites me. What excites me is when people are moving capital to create returns, but also you know, generate environmental or social mm -hmm. outcomes that they're targeting. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Well so said. come come together under multiple terms. Uh, but thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate Thanks it. For yeah, us. thank you. Thanks.